Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPD to advance excellent teaching. A fertile desert, gigantic tombs, a religion dedicated to immortality, and a ruler who made sure the sun rose each day. Why did this civilization last longer than any other? An extraordinary 3,000 years. The ancient Egyptians, this time on the Western tradition. Now UCLA professor Eugen Weber's continuing journey through the history of Western civilization. The Western tradition really begins in the East. That's where the sun rises. That's where the first civilizations arise from which ours would grow. That's where we find the fertile crescent which some books still describe as the cradle of civilization and which, as you can see, is a rather small portion of Asia and Africa that runs from Mesopotamia and Syria to Egypt. But the importance of this little bit of land can hardly be overstated. Many of the things that we take for granted today had their roots here thousands of years ago, from the money in our pockets uh, to our attitudes towards immortality. It's a paradox, but most of the so-called fertile crescent is relatively arid. About 5,000 years ago, the first permanent urban settlements were found only beside the river or by one of the springs that didn't dry up in the summer. On the other hand, the three main rivers, the Tigris, the Euphrates, and the Nile, frequently overflow their banks and turn the valleys into marshland. So agriculture was largely dependent on flood control and on irrigation. First you needed to drain the land, then you needed to keep it watered. But if you did all that, you had tremendously rich soil which could bear regular crops not just once but several times a year. So the land promised a lot, but it also imposed special conditions on the people who worked it. The ancient Egyptians often depicted the Nile and their relationship to it on wall paintings like this one. Digging irrigation channels and keeping them up are social tasks, even more than building walls to defend the village, and the more critical these social tasks are the more tightly knit the society must be to carry them out. Here we see men measuring a field for planting. The control of water in the fertile Pleasant also provided society with a very powerful sanction. People who did not conform could be excluded from water. In a temperate climate like that of Europe, there's usually plenty of water and this sort of exclusion is not tragic but in an arid zone, you can die of it. And this also helps to explain the early degree of organization among communities in the region. One of the best organized civilizations in the Crescent, though not necessarily the earliest, was to be found in Egypt, a place that I might best describe as an oasis in the desert. This relative isolation gave Egypt more unity than its neighbors and helped to make ancient Egyptians secure, stable, complacent, and very different from us. We are dynamic, aggressive, curious, 
interested in change and novelty and progress. The Egyptians were relatively passive. They did not think much about progress. They were more interested in stability, regularity, repetition, conservation. This allowed their culture to survive intact an extraordinary 3,000 years. For the ancient Egyptians, as for so many other peoples, geography was destiny. The Nile alone made life possible in the desert that surrounded it, as you can see in this scene of fishermen. It was about 10,000 years ago that the native population in what was then the Nile Swampy Valley switched from hunting and fishing to sowing crops. Over thousands of years, they figured out how to drain some of the swamps, turn them into farmland, harness the river water. So the Great Nile served as a lifeline to the Egyptians and also provided the need for cooperative effort and an organized way of life. And this led to a number of crucial developments sometime before 3000 BC. Astronomical charts and the calendar so you could keep track of seasonal regularities for your crops and writing to record all this information. The Egyptians used a kind of pictorial writing called hieroglyphics. Each image, each hieroglyph, originally stood for a word. This, for instance, is the sign for cattle. The Egyptians also used signs to represent a sound or a letter. These symbols represent the sounds B, H, and Z. And the word behez means calf. But because the Egyptians were such a literal people, they always wanted to use pictures next to the symbols. Eventually, they found something a little more practical to write on. A paper-like material which was made from the papyrus plant that grows all over the Nile Delta. The graceful fan of the papyrus reeds would then come to suggest the basic design of the typical Egyptian column, or at least of its capitals, which you can see today in their ruined temples. And so, Egyptian culture was shaped by its environment in a hundred different ways. When you look at the map, for instance, you can see that although the Nile Valley is very long, it's only seven miles wide, an oasis between two burning deserts. Because Egypt is compact and surrounded by desert, it's defensible against attack. And because of the Nile, it is predictable. So the river supports a static society where life is pretty secure and reasonably happy if we can judge by the confident tone of early documents. But above the Nile, there stands an even more powerful force, and that is the sun. The sun which perfects what the river started, and which burns so fiercely that it appears divine. As an Egyptologist has put it, the Nile demands that men coordinate their efforts. The sun reveals to them that a single power rules the world. This symbiosis between sun and river and river valley is reproduced in the two most important gods of Egypt, Ra and Osiris. Ra is the sun and the begetter of the gods themselves, the creator of life and order, both human and divine. Osiris is the earth, the god of fertilizing water and of vegetation. He is also, as shown here, the god of death and resurrection. Osiris also has a wicked brother named Seth who stands for all arid and unpleasant things, the desert, the night, the foreigner, disorder, and warfare. For the Egyptians, the struggle between Seth and Osiris symbolizes the cosmic drama, the cycle of death after life and life after death. 
Meanwhile, down in the valley, there's a man who is part god and part king. He is the pharaoh, named after the great house, the per o in which he held court. From the first warrior prince who called himself pharaoh around 3000 BC, to Cleopatra, the last Egyptian queen who died 30 years before Christ, Egypt counted 31 separate dynasties of pharaohs. To the Egyptians, it was Pharaoh who made sure the sun was going to rise by journeying through the night, symbolized by this leopard, and arriving safely at dawn. It was Pharaoh who guaranteed the harvest by being the first to wield a ceremonial hoe. And it was Pharaoh who threw a written order into the Nile as to when the flood should come. Luckily for him, it came so regularly that his command was invariably obeyed. If Pharaoh was a god, he was also the state. He owned everything his people owned, and he even owned the people themselves. All officials acted in his name. All held their offices subject to his divine pleasure. Law was not codified. It was based on custom, and it was held to be simply the king's word his personal interpretation of divine will and divine justice. You could not codify these decisions because every one of them was right for its particular moment and circumstances. And besides, once you wrote down a law, it acquired an impersonal authority of its own an authority that might compete with the authority of the divine being whose will and whim alone could be the law. Only Pharaoh expressed the ultimate truth and justice and goodness and cosmic force of harmony and order that the Egyptians called Mat. Here we see the final judgment of a dead man whose heart is being weighed against a feather from the goddess of truth and right. The power of Pharaoh was so absolute, in fact, that he not only controlled the laws of life on earth, but also access to eternity. Only he could be sure of a blessed afterlife going on forever. The only others who could even hope for eternal life were his family and those who went along to serve them in the hereafter. The pyramids indicate just how important the pharaoh's funeral arrangements were. One pharaoh after another built ever more monumental tombs. The very first pyramid was built at Saqqara during the third dynasty and it may well be the first example of stone architecture in history. Alongside the pyramid, one can still see the smaller tomb of a nobleman. Eventually, it was felt that if a noble could be buried close to the royal tomb, and if he could carve or paint his titles on his own tomb, explaining how he had served Pharaoh in the past, how he could serve him in the life to come, then he might have a chance of being taken along. Better still, of course, was to get your effigy right into the royal tomb, like this high official of Queen Hatshepsut, who had his portrait carved behind the doors of her temple so he could enter eternity with her. The climax of this funerary obsession came about 2600 BC with the pyramids of the fourth dynasty and especially with the great pyramid of Cheops at Giza just north of the capital which was then at Memphis. The great pyramid is nearly 500 feet high and it contains nearly two and a half million blocks of limestone, most of them two or three tons apiece, but some of them as much as 15 tons. Napoleon once sat down in its shade and calculated that the mass of stone above him would build a wall around France ten feet high and one foot thick. All of these stones were hauled up and put together with the most extraordinary accuracy by the muscle power of conscript labor. 
The laborers were put in work camps during the summer months when the river covered their fields and when the flooded surface offered a convenient transit for the stones from quarries on one bank to pyramids on the other. The Sphinx nearby is also monumental, 240 feet long by 66 feet high but at least it didn't have to be hauled in. It was carved out of a rock that happened to be there. The most imitable of Egyptian monuments, however, were the obelisks. Tapered pillars, each carved out of a single block of granite between 70 and 100 feet tall. Today you can see them in the capitals of Europe, and of course in Washington, where as usual, Americans have improved on the original and made it five times larger. Like the pyramids, obelisks represent and symbolize the shining cone of the sun's rays and also man's aspirations to immortality, to oneness with the gods. But effort involved in building these monuments couldn't be kept up for long. The drain on the country's manpower and resources was too heavy. Between 2500 and 2300 BC, the kings of the 5th and 6th dynasties built much smaller pyramids. And this decline in size was matched by a shrinking in the king's position and the concomitant rise of the priests and nobles. Egyptian culture flowered brilliantly during this time. Trade expeditions went abroad to Lebanon for cedar, to Crete for olive oil, and into the desert to mine copper. And the whole nation moved forward economically and intellectually in the first four dynasties. At first, all this redounded to the greater power and glory of the pharaoh. But as the state became more powerful and effective, the pharaoh had to have a larger number of servants. Government became more elaborate, offices increased, and officials who were sent out far from the capital found themselves increasingly on their own. They were supposed to exercise the will of the king, but actually they exercised independent judgment. And so, ironically, the centralizing forces of royal absolutism trying to expand and control more and more built up a decentralizing counteraction of individualism. When royal officials were successful in carrying out the pharaoh's commands, they were granted hereditary lands and perhaps even hereditary right to the offices they held. And as their wealth and position became more secure, the officials became less dependent on Pharaoh in this life and the next. Meanwhile, the great funerary foundations around the royal tombs, which were endowed with land to keep the priests praying and the dead kings happy, these great cities of death were not only using up important resources while they were being built, but their upkeep continued to eat up the land even after they were finished and their builder buried. So much of Egypt was bestowed on temples and tombs that the numbers and wealth of the priests rose dramatically. And at the same time, the pharaohs were parting with a lot of their land, which was the source of their wealth. As the wealth and power of the pharaohs decreased, there was more decentralization, both political and magical. In 2600 BC, in the fourth dynasty, and then in the fifth, the tombs of the nobles had clustered around the tombs of the king. By 2300 BC and the sixth dynasty, a lot of the nobles, like this one, built their tombs at home in the provinces, 
They and the priests and the high government officials became confident that they had a good chance of eternal life on their own. They didn't have to bother Pharaoh. They didn't have to bother with Pharaoh. Not only could they build for eternity, but they could also interpret Mat, the justice and truth that was once administered by the Pharaoh alone. And so the sixth dynasty ends in 2200 BC, and along with it, there ends the period known as the Old Kingdom. For two centuries afterwards, the decentralization of Egypt's failing kings brings fragmentation and anarchy with nobles and princes squabbling for supremacy. The so-called Middle Kingdom begins when a new dynasty of pharaohs restores order, but it too has a structural weakness. The pharaoh's word is no longer law. Laws begin to be written down, and Pharaoh himself is accepted only as long as he is powerful and alert. With the increasing independence of the nobles, it's only a matter of time before the royal family loses its grip. We get another period of war, disunity and disorder between the 1700s and 1500s BC. But this time foreigners from the northeast break in, warlike peoples much better armed than the Egyptians with horses and chariots and stronger bows. These are the Hyksos, the shepherd kings from Asia. Egypt was no longer an oasis now, but a battlefield. For the first time, part of its territory was conquered by foreigners. The deep sense of security from attack, which had been the cornerstone of the Egyptian system, was fractured. When the foreigner was finally cast out in the 16th century before Christ, he was succeeded by great warrior pharaohs whose heroic efforts are pictured in many wall carvings. Under this new kingdom, Egypt was going to have more periods of glory and more years of peace, roughly from the 1500s to 1000 BC. Obviously, things weren't too bad, because it's from this period that some very charming paintings survive of people hunting and banqueting. And in one of the banquet scenes, an old blind harpist sings a song, which like all good things in Egypt is an old song, but one which would continue to be sung for a long time. And this is how the song ends. Spend a happy day, rejoice in the sweetest perfumes. Adorn the neck and arms of your wife with lotus flowers and keep your loved one seated always at your side. Call no halt to music and dance, but bid all care be gone. Spare thought for nothing but pleasure, for soon your turn will come to journey to the land of silence. This was nice, but the Egyptians never forgot the Hyksos humiliation, and they became nervous and insecure. The new kingdom was faced with new invasions, and a powerful class of professional soldiers and administrators came to run the country, along with the omnipresent priests. By this time, the power of the divine kings had become a facade for a stiff, formalistic hierarchy and bureaucracy based less on tradition and custom than on rules and laws, less on mat than on formal discipline and pietism. Unfortunately for the new kingdom, the Egyptians would rather enjoy life than fight. Military service was always unpopular and armament was frequently backward. So whenever the Egyptians clashed with strong armies, they usually lost, which is what we see happening in the thousand years before Christ. 
After Egypt was last conquered in 330 BC by Alexander the Great, it was ruled by the Ptolemies, descendants of one of Alexander's generals, until the last dynasty came to an inglorious end with the suicide of Cleopatra and colonization by Rome. But the most fascinating thing is that all this time the image of Pharaoh remained the same. The Egyptian ideal, the conventional style and models established 3,000 years before, these endured longer than anything in the Western world. And yet, while the form persisted, the substance changed. The relative security and serenity of the Egyptians had cracked. The song of the harper continued to be sung, but its words didn't mean anything anymore, or else they referred to a golden age long ago and far away. In our next program, we shall return to the Fertile Crescent to examine the Mesopotamians who are as similar to us as the Egyptians were different. Until then. Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPB programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.